and he always shared his discoveries with me. The only thing he kept private was his journal. Then that's what we have to find. I wouldn't know where to begin to look. Could your father have ever given you a clue as to where to start? He never told me how to start. But he may have told me how to end. End? Yeah. He read the same poem to me every night before bed and every time he left. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And that's a clip from Artemis Fowl. I'm delighted to say we've been joined by its director, who is none other than Sir Kenneth Chuckles Branner, who joins us from, I don't know where, where are you? Where are you, Ken? I can see you, but I don't know where you are. I'm in Long Cross Studios in, in the heart of London's London, or just outside London's London. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. This, okay. Well, it's, very, it's very nice to see you. How do we find you uh, in lockdown? How's it, has it been for you? A strange time to be promoting a movie. Uh, yes, it is. Um, but, you know, stranger times for lots of people. And we, we've had the chance to be working on the... We finished this film, Artemis Fowl, a little while ago, but we've been working quite intensively during lockdown on Death on the Nile, uh, mm -hmm. which we shot in the autumn and, and all things being equal will come out in October of this year. So basically, I, I, my head's been down on, on finishing that, which because of digital technology has been possible we'd reached a point in post-production where it was possible to do lots of things remotely albeit a little more time consumingly but um that's what i've been up to so the mustache is back the mustache is back yes it went <laughs> into, a, into a carry case that was brought out of a dark cupboard yes uh okay well that's for uh later on in the year we're talking artemis fowl a book i read to my son when it came out so i've been aware of this for for a long time when did you first know of this uh, this very funny kids book Artemis Fowl when did you hear about it Ken? Uh, 2015 I was on a holiday with uh, members of my family including my nephews who were 11 and 9 and they were both reading it and they said you've got to read this Uncle Ken it's your next film I said well it, you know it may not be as simple <laughs> as that voice but I, I'm happy to read it <laughs> and I did and it was nice to read it I, so there was no other agenda other than they were they, they said you must read it and I enjoyed it as a reader very, very much, as you say, it's funny, and it was kind of anarchic. And then a few weeks later, because I was at that time working on finishing Disney's Cinderella, they said, have you heard of Artemis Fowl? Of course, I just had. And, and, uh, and so I began a conversation about, uh, uh, about working on it back then in 2015. So it came via family and started there. Well, it's, as I remember, everyone searches for the strap line, the perfect strap line or the elevator pitch. And as I remember, Die Hard with Fairies was on the cover. I mean, it was there as, as a one-liner, which was the perfect pitch very early on. Is that right? Uh, you are right about that. And, and also Owen Colfer, who coined that about this first Siege book, w w was also... Uh, minded to d describe the original, getting the original idea is coming up with the idea of of of, of creating an eleven year old Bond villain uh, and putting him in a fairy story. Um, so Owen is brilliant at kind of encapsulating the nub of uh, these Irish flights of fancy, which he he has about about this character and these stories. One thing that that remark that you draw my attention back to that inspired me was to feel as though, and I maintained it from that moment back in 2015, talking to the studio, was that I wanted the movie to go very quickly, to be as as, as much of a sort of a ride, an exhilarating ride, either die hardish, we should be so lucky, uh, or um, <laughs> or um, you know, like a, a an old Saturday morning adventure for those of us a certain age who remember going to the pictures and seeing serials, the kind of thing that inspired Spielberg to do Indiana Jones, where you've got this relentless incident, often tumbling one after the other. It's it's all hair raising, it's all high octane, and it's very brief. You get in and you get out of the adventure quickly. And I always fancied doing that with this. The movie in the end is now ninety five minutes, which compared to a lot of pictures, perfect. <laughs> Every movie can be an hour and a half. It's uh, it's it's absolutely true, and it, you're absolutely right. It does. It speeds along at an incredible pace. Uh, two things particularly relating to the movie. Can, can I ask you about the casting uh, of Artemis Fowl? Because obviously, if you get the wrong kid, then the whole movie it doesn't matter how good everyone else is. Then you're going to struggle. Tell us how you found. 30 years sure. We got a great casting director, Lucy Bevan, and she began a search worldwide, not just in Ireland, but in Ireland. We saw about 1,200 kids. Around the world, we found that it was very hard for people from America or Canada or Australia to do an Irish accent convincingly. That was really terribly difficult for an 11, 12-year-old. 
Ferdy Ashore, you know, was very prominent from the word go. It was about a nine month process where we tried to work out, you know, could this person carry the responsibility of carrying the movie, not be thrown by it, not be panicked? Could they do the physical stuff? Could they remain, as Ferdia did during this process, uh, amused by it? He clearly had a, a sense of humor. He was wry about it. He enjoyed it. He, you could, he didn't get overwhelmed. And I think the key was that he loved the books. He just loved them. So he was an expert. In fact, you didn't need Owen Colfer on the set. The representative of the writer was <laughs> Ferdia Shaw, who, quite frankly, and rather annoyingly every now and again, would say, you know, they didn't say that, Ken. You didn't do that. That's book three. You've got that completely wrong. He would point out in front of large numbers of people. As you may know, not the greatest thing to be corrected by an 11-year-old when you're trying to be all butch and commanding. But uh, anyway, it was good for me. And he was great. And he had a great chemistry with Lara McDonald, who plays Holly Short, his sort of nemesis in the movie. And also he was unintimidated by working with the great and the good, like Dame Judi Dench. He could, he could hold his own, as it were. And he's, he's part of that. And I think it's fair enough to mention that he's the grandson of Robert Shaw, and I just rewatched Jaws just the other day, actually, because we were talking about it on the TV, me and Mark. So, th- so it's in his DNA. I mean, is that is that fair? Is that fair to say if he wasn't phased by any of it? Maybe because it's in the blood. Very possibly, but he's his own man. You know, he comes from a very interesting family. They're very intelligent, supportive, fun. They're sort of creative. So he, he has a strong, strongly developed personality and view of the world. And plus, he. He does all his normal stuff. He loves playing tennis. He enjoyed all the all the physical stuff that Artemis does, the surfing, the skateboarding, who wouldn't? And he threw himself at that. But he definitely has a kind of nice askew sort of look at the world. Reminded me a bit of Dave Allen, the great Irish comedian. He just had a, yeah. you know, he, he just, he wasn't phased. He's his own guy. So there was an old soul quality to him, as well as just a perfectly 11, 12 and 13 year old guy as he was across the making of this picture. And yet you, you've told fantasy stories before, of course, but how did you approach the idea of creating this world of fairies, which as a book, of course, it, it was it's, it's a beautiful piece of creation. But then realizing it for the screen, how much of a challenge was that? Ken? It's a big challenge because you realize that Owen beautifully leaves space. He, he indicates much, but he leaves a lot of space for the imagination of the audience, who, of course, then own their version of what Haven City, the home of the fairies, is like. And as a filmmaker, it can be a bit intimidating to land on something that may please some and not please others. So basically, you have to follow your own instinct about what you think you responded to about the size and the scale and the variety of people. And you're always influenced by great movies of the past. So Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, all of those places that create meeting places for massively different tribes of people. And uh, that becomes a fun thing to do. And it becomes a big collaborative thing with your DP, with your costume designer, etc. And we went for all the kind of natural inspirations of Ireland itself, the mosses, the greens, the ferns, and, and Irish folklore and the illustrations in the great book, the books and book of Kells. And the, you know, we go to the great places, the Giant's Causeway up near where I come from, and try and find your way of fusing that into the movie and making it particular and taking the risk that you'll you'll win some people over and you'll lose some others did it help being an irishman yourself i think maybe it it helped um yes i think recognize that in owen's humor was something anarchic and irish you know and very sort of um both self-aware and kind of uh happy in its own skin you know, he, he yeah. Owen has been incredibly patient for a man who's had these rights sold to movie companies for the last 20 years and still the movie wouldn't get made. And he could still be funny about it. 20 years on, he still he still had a, a smile about it. So there was something Irish about that, I think, that, that combined romance, passion and a bit of melancholy, all with a Mickey taking approach to the world. I enjoyed the music very much. Ken, you've worked with Patrick Doyle many, many times. What is it? What is it about his music that brings you back every time? He really responds to drama and situations. He always arrives early, 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 much earlier than most composers. He'll come to read-throughs and he'll be early there and he'll be around the shooting uh, world. He'll, he'll meet characters. He'll, he makes his notes. He'll sometimes do a little sort of suite of impressions. He'll, do, he'll just sort of improvise piano a year ahead of what the score might be. It could all change, but he's basically trying to drink fully in the characters and the place. And uh, of course, he's a Celt himself. He's a, he's a, a Scotsman. And, and so that sort of Celtic uh, passion is in him. He's got this incredible gift for melody. And, uh, and he, he, he likes sort of original instruments. So 
he, he's he's very enthusiastic and so his his passion is always in the music and i love that in pictures like this yes it's it's a beautiful score am i writing i might have got this completely wrong ken but it i think you have an uncredited cameo um do i have an uncredited cameo? yes i do actually i do you know yeah yes you, i i i appear vocally but so does uh, yes. so does so does owen colfer we both get, there are so many pieces of uh, reported news footage that um, in the end we ran out of people and I was lucky enough to get the author and then I was the last person we could afford. <laughs> well, I noticed. I just want to say that I, that I absolutely noticed it. Thank you. Um, can I, I want to ask you one question about Tenet, which you're not going to be able to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Robert Pattinson was in the paper saying that he was, he didn't realize what the movie was about. And he had, he felt like virtually finished filming and he still didn't really understand what the story is. Do you understand the story of Tenet? I would say that I'm in the process of understanding it. I read, the, <laughs> I read the script more times than any script I have ever read. I swear to goodness. And and I remember just a few times, I can't tell you where the specifics were, but I began a few sentences almost every day to Chris Nola saying, so I just, want, I just want to get this right, Chris. You need me to do the following. And then I would explain what I thought. Sorry, this is going to sound stupid. And then I'd finish it and you'd say, no, nope, that's what I need you to do. I said, oh, okay, I'm going to need a little bit of time for that. And, and it, you know, it, it'll reveal itself in the movie, but I would say it was a kind of linguistic and kind of mental equivalent of... Um, times three, tapping your head and rubbing your tummy, um, and involved accents and backwards forwardsness. That's great. I don't understand a word of what you're talking about, which is precisely the way you constructed the, uh, the answer. I have one final uh, question, which we're talking a lot about on the program, asking all our, our guests to try and imagine what kind of world cinema is going to be in when we finally get out of this. And obviously, Chris Nolan is hoping that Tenet is going to be the big kind of tentpole movie and people will go and see it in IMAX. But as a filmmaker uh, yourself, can you dream, can you imagine the kind of world of cinema that's going to come out of this COVID period? Well, I imagine that there will be one. I'm not quite sure what it will look like. I know that it will depend on on two things. The the, the willingness of people to uh, take what we hope will be a risk-free invitation to go to the cinema. It must be, otherwise they mustn't go and we mustn't do it. But if it is risk-free in terms of personal health, then I think that the second part of the equation is it's got to be a great movie. And I think Chris Nolan has done something pretty remarkable with Tenet. And if there was ever a reason to go back to the cinema to see a story that that is born to be enjoyed with big images, that's the one. It's all the things you might want from cinema. It's broadly popular and entertaining, but it takes the audience's intelligence, assumes that they, they want to be uh, stretched and informed and, 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 and entertained as well. And he, he, he does it in such a wholehearted way that I, I, as I always have done, I take my hat off to him in his complete devotion to cinema. That that devotion at this time might be that extra bit of glue that gets us back into the communal experience, which I miss hugely. And I shall be, you know, first in the queue for that picture. Uh, Ken, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thanks, Simon. Very nice to see you.